Coming up on DTNS, T-Mobile gets closer to being able to buy Sprint. Web accessibility heads to the Supreme Court. And why eating crickets is not only industry 4.0, but also good for you. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 26th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from uh, a relatively balmy Southern California, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Joining us, very happy to have Aaron Carson, staff reporter from CNET, back on the show. Aaron, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. We were just talking to Aaron on Good Day Internet about uh, her cosplaying at Comic-Con. Uh, you can read that story of CNET, of course. Uh, or if you're not already a patron, get our conversation at patreon.com slash DTNS. I would recommend doing both of those things. Uh, thanks for chatting with us about that, Aaron. Absolutely. We are going to be talking with Aaron about eating crickets. And there is a technology angle to it for sure. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. It is Friday Numbers Friday. Alphabet announced it earned $14.21 per share in Q2 on revenue of $38.94 which beat analyst expectations. Search adver uh, advertising revenue rose 16%. Paid clicks increased 28% on the year. Other revenue, which includes cloud and pixel hardware, generated $6.18 billion in revenue, up 39.5% on the year. On the earnings call, CEO Sundar Pichai said that the cloud unit had reached an $8 billion annual run rate, doubling since February of 2018. Alphabet's other bets revenue, which includes the uh, non-Google companies like Waymo and Loon, rose 12% to $162 million, but lost almost $1 billion in the quarter. Amazon reported it earned $5.22 a share on revenue of $63.4 billion, beating expectations on revenue, but just missing those expectations on earnings. Amazon Web Services grew revenue 37% on the year. Amazon's other category, which includes its ever-burgeoning online sales, grew revenue 37%. And physical store revenue was flat on the quarter at $4.3 billion. CEO Jeff Bezos said the introduction of prime one-day delivery raised costs more than they expected, but produced accelerating sales growth. So he's not worried. WhatsApp confirmed it now has 400 million monthly active users in India. Facebook had previously announced that the app had 250 million users in 2017, so it's quite a jump from that. Counterpoint Research estimates that India has 450 million smartphone users overall, although WhatsApp also is available on feature phones, including those running chaos. All right, let's talk a little more about the big news this morning. The U.S. Department of Justice has approved uh, an agreement for the merger of T-Mobile USA with Sprint. The merged company has agreed to sell wholesale network access, some of its Spectrum licenses, and the Boost, Virgin, and Sprint-branded prepaid businesses to Dish Network as part of an agreement with the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice wanted to create another competitor if it allowed T-Mobile and Sprint to merge. So the merged Sprint and T-Mobile must also provide access to a few hundred, actually maybe even close to a thousand retail locations, depending on how you look at it. And Dish and the merged T-Mobile must agree to support eSIM which could encourage the adoption of eSIM. For its part, DISH promises to deploy a 5G broadband network capable of serving 70% of the United States by June 2023. Now, this doesn't end the merger. We're not ready to close yet. 13 U.S. states, as well as the District of Columbia, have sued to block the merger. So that will need to be resolved before the merger can finally be called closed. And uh, the FCC hasn't actually technically approved it either. They've expressed approval, but the FCC still needs to have its formal vote, which should be coming soon. How uh, how much do we think that the uh, 13 U.S. states uh, who oppose the merger might slow this down, at, even assuming that it's going to go through eventually? That's hard to say because the states are a little more stringent than the Department of Justice seems to have been about uh, not wanting to raise costs for consumers, not wanting to reduce competition. And a lot of the attorneys general involved in that have already spoken regarding this particular agreement saying it doesn't go far enough that the the dish agreement isn't going to create a viable competitor at least anytime soon which means there'll be less competition which they say will mean higher prices uh i 
I, I'm kind of on the fence on that one, to be honest. It sounds to me like they are giving Dish Spectrum, they're giving them retail locations, and they're giving them MVNOs, Boost and, and Virgin, uh, as well as Sprint's MVNO prepaid business. So they're, they're setting them up well. But yeah, I mean, Dish doesn't have any poll access right now. So it's going to take a while to roll out their own service, even if, if they are uh, having the license for the Spectrums, uh, which means they would have to pay T-Mobile Sprint merged entity to get network access, uh, which they will get access as part of this agreement, but it still costs money. Uh, there's a lot of questions there, but I think this is probably the best you could do if you want the mobile, the merger to happen. Whether those 13 states are going to let it happen, I don't know. Aaron, what do you think? I mean, I think this is all just a reminder that this is not something that gets settled quickly. We've been in this kind of situation for more than a year now. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's definitely more ahead. I think it would also be kind of interesting to see um, just like the effects of how much further, you know, how this pushes the industry more towards 5G as well. Yeah, I I, I like that they're giving Dish a lot of tools. Uh, I I do see that it's not rock solid that Dish will be able to pull this together. On the other hand, Dish is very motivated because its television business, even with Sling TV, uh, is not looking promising as far as continuing to develop revenue for them. So they need another revenue generator and a phone service could do that. Whether they have the expertise to pull it off is really the big question, I think. Intel reported revenue declined by 3% on the year, but revenue and earnings still be analyst expectations, and Intel's Q3 forecast is ahead of expectations as well. On the earnings call, CEO Bob Swan said that anxiety over trade uncertainty drove a pull-in of client CPU orders in the quarter. In other words, what he means is they sold more chips because companies stockpiled in advance of trade disruptions. Two factories are now producing 10 nanometer chips and seven nanometer is still on track for 2021. Intel also said it had resumed some product sales to Huawei in compliance with U.S. regulators. Yeah, Intel's not out of the woods yet by any stretch, but uh, the 10 nanometer uh, factories, I think, surprised people how how good the ramp up is going there. Seven nanometer still being on track is, of course, good news. Uh there is the expectation and, and question that, you know, trade disputes are not going to keep tweaking the sales up uh, forever, but it sounds like they'll at least carry on into Q3 enough for Intel to forecast a little better Q3 than they would have otherwise. Uh, whether they can bring back their market share dominance a little more is going to be the big question for Intel going forward because they are they are facing declining market share. Uh, it does seem like Bob Swan is continuing what Kurzanich had sort of tentatively started, which is focusing Intel on fewer markets. Uh, getting rid of the, the modem business to Apple is, is is a more extreme version of that. Kurzanich was was doing things like selling off the, the streaming TV development. They sold that to Verizon. Uh, now Swan seems to be focusing it even more on let's do what we do well and and march forward there. That's a little bit of a risky decision though, because uh, you have you have less diverse markets to be able to play inside of. I do, I do, uh, I do think this is a good report for Intel, even though some of the the revenue is down uh, by numbers. It's better than everybody expected it to be down, and it's not down as much as people expected. So, uh, overall, fairly positive. Twitter revenue was up 18% over the last year with monetizable daily active users at 139 million, up 14% on the year. That daily monetizable active users is a new metric this report uh twitter is measuring users who are logged in and can see ads on a daily basis not just seeing an embedded post uh which is in a way more accurate uh just somebody Absolutely, seeing, yeah. yeah especially seeing for third-party uh twitter uh app users like myself and if your focus is on advertising you want to say well these are the users that could potentially see an ad us revenue uh for twitter was up 24 percent while international revenue rose 12 percent uh if you're curious japan is twitter's number two best market for revenue after the united states twitter made 727 million dollars in advertising 114 million dollars on data licensing so advertising continues to be be the predominant revenue source for Twitter. And CEO Jack Dorsey uh, said that reports of spammy or suspicious behavior on Twitter dropped 18%. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know about that one. That's at the point where well, I'm, I'm like, sure it did, but 
okay. Sure. Is, yeah. How big De- is eighteen percent? De- yeah, it depends on who you're following and who your followers are, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, this all looks pretty positive for Twitter. Yeah, considering that in the past Twitter has had you know face challenges attracting new users and retaining the users it has, like this could be a sign of progress. Yeah, it it doesn't seem bad. A lot of people are criticizing the the metric of monetizable daily active users because they say, well, this isn't comparable to anybody else. Nobody else does this. So you can't look at Twitter's number. But it's, but it's the smarter metric, isn't it? Wouldn't this actually, you would think that, you know, Facebook and Google and and other large social networks that are in Twitter's camp would would say, well, you know, if Twitter's doing it, then we need to do it as well because it actually makes more sense as a metric. Yes and no, though. If they if if it made so much sense, why didn't they do it before now? Well, because know. for them, the monthly active user is a bigger number, right? Because sure. over the course of a month, you can show a bigger number. What Twitter was doing was seeing their monthly active users go down <laughs> while their daily active users weren't. So reporting daily active users was good. Reporting monetizable daily active users, even better because that number kept going up and up. So that's the criticism is like, well, yeah, you can justify this, but you're cherry picking the one metric that looks good for you. Well, but at the same time, monthly active users, if I log into some something, uh, you know, any service, whatever it may be, any platform once a month, I'm not really using it that often, but I'm still counted in that number. If I'm a daily active user, I am I am very important for whatever company I I am I am logging into. So I I, I think it's smart uh, for Twitter to be leaning into that number. Yeah, Aaron, do you, do you have any thoughts on on this new metric? Oh, on the on the on the new uh, metric, there'd probably be a, a different CNET person to, <laughs> to talk to about that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's you know in the kind of the broader lifespan of of, of Twitter and and how much time there was for a while where it seemed like things were just kind of going south. It's, uh, it's always always interesting to. I, I was reading something that was kind of interesting. It was um talking about kind of their continued uh investment in like live events like you know sports like they're mm-hmm. going to be uh the kind Olympics. of yeah partnering with like nbc universal on some limited coverage of the olympics and and whatnot and uh really leaning into that idea that for award shows or sporting events or kind of similar things there are times when people like really do flock to twitter to to talk about what's going on Three years ago, Guillermo Robles filed a lawsuit against Domino's. Yes, that Domino's. Alleging that uh, the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act applied to websites and apps of businesses with physical locations and said Domino's was part of that. A federal appeals court ruled in favor of Robles. Domino's argues that the federal government has not published rules on how to make websites ADA compliant. Only international standards exist. In 2017, the Department of Justice reversed a 2010 announcement that it would issue rules for website accessibility. Domino's now has asked the Supreme Court to hear the case. The Chamber of Commerce, the Restaurant Law Center, and the National Retail Federation have all submitted a friend of the court briefs. And CNBC notes that two, uh, 2,200 lawsuits were filed over website accessibility in federal courts last year. Yeah, so uh, Supreme Court probably won't get to deciding whether to take this up or not until the autumn session. Uh, It will not necessarily be heard by the Supreme Court. They could decide to just let the federal uh, court decision stand, in which case Robles wins, uh, or they could hear it again, in which case they could rule either way. I, there is some merit. It's 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 easy to for me anyway to want to take the side of Robles and say yes, accessibility everywhere, and Domino should do this, and Beyonce.com should do this, everyone should do this because Beyonce.com is a big suit too. Uh, but there is some validity, I think, to the Domino's argument that well, wait a minute, if we spend a bunch of money making our site accessible, and then the government comes out with some new regulations because an administration changes, and now we aren't meeting those compliances because we didn't have the guidance, that's going to be costly. We wanna wait until we're sure what the requirements are for these websites before we spend the money on it. But I mean, as as a, a corporation, you could always say that, right? You could always be like, well, the government might change some rules, so we're not gonna put money into this. 
Well, yeah, but uh, it, it's not about changing the rules, though. It's about having no rules. So in, in, at least when the rules are changed, you can lobby against the change in rules and you can say to someone suing you, I am following the rules that exist. Right now, there's no rules that exist for the for the websites to follow. I mean, I think that aside from the specifics of the case, something that uh, kind of came to mind is that this underlines how big of an issue accessibility is still in tech. Because we're even just mm -hmm. talking about like a, like a basic website that you might go on to order pizza. Um, so like Pew, the Pew Research Center has a stat that says that Americans with disabilities are 20 percent like less likely to, to go online at all. And so, and so I think it's, you know, it's a difficult situation because we are seeing, uh, you know, more companies and people being starting to be more mindful of features that could help folks with accessibility issues. But I think that a lot of advocates would say that they'd prefer if things were just kind of baked in to the product from the get go. Yeah. I after all of my, you know, devil's advocate arguing just now, the one thing I want to make sure to say is Domino's should make their website and their app accessible anyway, whether whether yeah. it's going to help Sell them in their pizzas. case or not, right? Yeah. Like uh, saying, well, there's no guidance, so I shouldn't be sued is one thing. Saying there's no guidance, so I'm not going to make it accessible, that's just wrong. Uh, make your site accessible. You'll you'll get more people spending money on your site that, that don't spend their money right now because they can't. That's why Robles is filing this lawsuit. He twice tried to use the website to order a pizza and couldn't because it wasn't accessible and, and he's visually impaired. So just just do it. It's the right thing to do. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you win your court case, maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe there's something where if they tried to make their site accessible now, it would undermine their case. There's, there's always weird stuff like that. But the right thing to do is to make it accessible. All right, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Uh, at Comic-Con, TBS was giving out protein bars as a promotion for the upcoming TV show Snowpiercer, which, uh, like the movie Snowpiercer, tells the story of a train with the last remnants of humanity living in an icy post-apocalyptic world. So the protein bars were made with cricket powder because, well, when it's the end of the world, maybe bugs are only the thing you're going to have to eat. Aaron, you got to taste one of these cricket powder protein bars. How was it? I did indeed. And I'm happy to report that it tasted like peanut butter and jelly and not cricket. <laughs> wow. Now, is that because it had other ingredients in it, right? Not just the cricket powder. Right. Yeah. So the, the cricket powder is just you know, one ingredient along with a, you know, bunch of other stuff, including like whole peanuts and uh, fresh strawberries and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I think the big distinction that these folks are trying to make is like in the show, uh, the bug bars are not good. They're not, they're, they're kind of this terrible jellied bug mm. mixture. And um, at Comic-Con, the company that's behind these bars, this fire food group, is actually trying to present you with something that you like you you might eat actually and not hate. So, so the texture was just like a normal protein bar then. Oh yeah. It, I don't think I would have known that there was cricket in it if I hadn't um, been aware in advance. I've heard cricket has a nutty taste, and you have actually tasted roasted crickets prior to Comic-Con, right? Correct, yeah. I have a cricket eating experience. Uh, the the thing that kind of stands out to me is like this malty aftertaste, uh, um, which I, malty, I, I find delightful in like the chocolate Whoppers, but mm -hmm. for some reason in crickets, it's like, don't <laughs> like it quite as much, go figure. <laughs> um, but I will say having had some other food that is maybe not the whole roasted crickets, but say like a granola or even a um, chocolate chip cookie that's made with cricket powder. That's, that's, uh, you don't get quite as much of that undertone in there. Cause it's ground up and it's just kind right. of lost in the rest of the ingredients. Now these bars come from a company called Aspire Food Group out of Austin, Texas, which you've reported on previously as well. Uh, they have a 25,000 square foot building designed for cricket raising. And what I noted from your article on this is they have robots uh, for feeding the crickets. They have industrial sensors that monitor 30 million data points, things like temperature and humidity. They use machine learning to analyze the data, to optimize things like down to the hour, things like time and temp. Uh, so 
this fits the definition of industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is this idea that we're going to combine sensors and data analysis and machine learning and robotics uh, to revolutionize how industry is done. And it looks like the, the cricket food makers are already doing that. Yeah, they're on it. I mean, I think for them, one of their big goals is to optimize how they grow these crickets. So these folks want to know what is the optimum temperature and humidity and whatever other metric for a cricket at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on day seven of its life cycle. And I mean, that's that's really just to get like the, the best cricket possible for harvesting. <laughs> 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 and I, I'm sure there's people who are like, okay, great, but why? Why? Wh wh why do we need anyone even making crickets? Uh, the, those people are. There's probably plenty of people in the audience who are like, I don't want to eat crickets. Why do I need to eat crickets? Sure. Yeah. And that's yeah. I mean, that has to be question number one. Um, so Aspire is basically making this pitch that this is a matter of sustainability, of like uh, environmental sustainability. Um, when you compare the resources that go into raising livestock, you know, the kind of meat that a lot of us eat on a daily basis, whether it's cows or pigs or, you know, mm -hmm. any of that, it takes a lot less land and water produces a much smaller carbon footprint to produce crickets. And you can raise a lot more of them in a lot shorter time frame. And so they're kind of presenting this idea that in order to be more environmentally friendly, we really need to kind of dial back how much um like meat we're eating it's just it's it's more sustainable uh right. to, to make get your protein from crickets crickets are high in iron they're high in protein calcium uh and uh the united nations estimates at least two billion people already include bugs in their diets of various forms so it's really just getting over the ick factor right Sure. Yeah. And I think that this, you know, speaks to the idea of how much a mindset can impact our kind of dietary habits. Um, when you see something like 2 billion and there are other stats that go even, you know, beyond that as far as how many people in this world or how many countries in this world eat bugs on the regular um, and, and, and for reasons of like they're good or they're tasty, uh, you kind of get this idea that maybe this is our hang up, you know, um, but I think that something that's worth noting, because I remember when I originally interviewed uh, the CEO and co-founder of Aspire, he was saying, like, look, you'd be forgiven for not wanting to take something that you found in your backyard that's dirty and from the ground and put it on your mouth. But, you know, what they're saying is, like, this is not that. We're not expecting you to go into your backyard and catch your dinner. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can if you want, but you should probably follow a lot of procedures to make that sanitary, right? I, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because we had some wild mint growing in our backyard. And I told my wife like, Hey, this is actually mint. We could use this. And she's like, did the dog pee on it? I'm like, Oh yeah, <laughs> maybe I, we could wash it. She's like, nah, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah it's, it, yeah, it's a whole different situation. Uh, and it reminded me of uh, the economist did on its future of the history, the history of the future podcast recently regarding eating bugs and crickets uh, was part of that. The fact that potatoes were initially thought unfit for human consumption when they were brought to Europe. Europeans thought they caused leprosy. Uh, they thought because they were not mentioned in the Bible and grew underground, they were uh, devil's apples. That was a nickname for potatoes. And it wasn't until France's King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, <laughs> yes, that Marie Antoinette, uh, started to push for potatoes to be used uh, and Frederick the Great mandated the cultivation in Prussia in 1756, that potatoes changed their image. Pe people felt about potatoes at one point the way you probably feel about eating crickets. And maybe the the point there is we need like some kind of a cricket influencer, you know? Right. Who is our modern day Frederick the Great or Marie Antoinette? Yeah, well, because back in the day, where where were potatoes coming from? Well, they were coming from overseas. They were from this weird, yeah. far-off land, at least sure. as far as Europeans were concerned. And, and you know, which may have been looked down upon for a variety of reasons, right? So the idea of eating crickets, uh, even if it's uh, nutritionally a, a great idea, you know, there, there's something to get over that as well. 
Well, you know, it's weird because that people have such a hang up about eating insects because when you eat a prawn or eat a lobster or eat a crab, it's not that far off, really. And this is the weird thing. My wife loves prawns, but she will not eat the ones from a Chinese restaurant because they leave the head on, the legs on. It just looks gross to her. It's like, well, what if you just take these and you just pull out the the portion that would be considered the meat, right? You leave out the eyes, leave out the mandibles, the legs. I think, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be too bad. You just but, call it- but, but then you also get into the whole sort of like people not really understanding what they're eating. You know, if you if you take out all of the... That's like 80% the, the, of the processed the, food we eat. Well, sure. But, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, I think, I think that... Uh, Everyone being a little bit more woke about what they're eating is a good thing in general. And and part of that is knowing that, yes, yeah, something that you might really enjoy might have had a head and legs well, or a tail. Like, for example, I was mentioning earlier in Good Day Internet, um, there is a natural coloring agent they use for food coloring, but they just call it natural coloring. But it's for this blue color. Uh, in some instances, it's essentially just a ground up beetle. Like they take the beetle and they roast it and they grind it into a powder to make yeah, the Yeah, and they call it natural flavors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, you know, you're probably eating an insect. And when you're a kid, you eat an insect or two, either well, as a but, dare but, or accidentally. Aaron, I, I, I think that the, the company Aspire in Austin is trying to do a lot to get around that, right? They While they do have some packets of full crickets, uh, a lot of their products don't have the legs on or are just powders that, that are providing protein directly into a bar like you had. Yeah, absolutely. And they're also making an effort to um, kind of create, I think, a little bit of, of mental space. You know, the way that we don't say the reading cow, we generally say beef or mm-hmm. pork versus pig. They have a product called a keta. So you don't have to sit there and be like, well, you know, what do I want to snack on? Crickets. So you're like, no, some 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 just ni- nice, delightful a keta. A keta is the new beef. There you go. You heard it here first, folks. I, I don't know. I, I, there, there's a lot of regulations about not having bugs in, you know, like you're not allowed to have a, more than a certain amount of bugs parts per million in your cereal and stuff. So there's some, some regulations they're going to have to change too, to be like, no, no, we meant these bugs. These bugs are, these bugs are sanitary. They've, you know, they've, they've been treated. They're meant for human consumption, but it is in the end, if you if you can get past thinking about it, just protein, right? Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes there are bug stories. Sometimes there aren't. You can submit your own and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. We have a group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. I know we will get emails about eating bugs, uh, but what did we get emails about from previous shows? <laughs> it actually wasn't about bugs. This one came from Paul and it was on the subject of retweets from yesterday's show. Paul says, I have to think that the problem is going to have to be fixed by an adjustment of social norms and any engineering fix would probably just be gamed immediately. That said, I encounter this problem more on Facebook when my feed is just flooded with shares. What I would like is a way to just block all shares or on Twitter, retweets that don't add anything to the post or the conversation. I think this would make social media more pleasant and perhaps tackle the RT problem in a backward way by in, by de-incentivizing, blindly sharing or retweeting something without having to put some skin in the game. How do you determine whether it's contributing something to the conversation? I think that's the difficult part there. Or or, or if it's a blind share rather than yeah. something that you really cared about. Yeah, that's a tough Because I one. like the idea that Paul has here. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it starts to get into the gaming situation of like, well, how do you determine whether it is adding anything to the conversation? Well, it almost seems like what Paul is saying is the, the quote retweet is the way to go. Like oh, if yeah. If you don't have anything right. extra to say, then you shouldn't retweet it because then you're just sort of passing something Mm -hmm. along without without um offering your opinion but at the same time that isn't always the case yeah i i don't know it's a it's a good thought though and and i think the you know the idea of i I wouldn't mind having an option to just turn off retweets sometimes like hey you know what i just don't want to see retweets so let me see my timeline without the retweets see what it looks like yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. Uh, Aaron Carson, a, a wonderful person to retweet. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today on the show on DTNS and let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Yeah, so you can always find me on CNET.com and on Twitter, speaking of which, I am at Aaron Carson. 
Excellent. And retweet Aaron uh, frequently. <laughs> yes, uh, do that. Also, uh, support us on Patreon. Uh, we have lots of great uh, con content there that is extending the show, including Good Day Internet, a, a larger version of the show where we talk about other things. Uh, Roger Chang had his uh, weekly column uh, go up uh, yesterday. If, you, if you're at the associate producer level or up, go check out all the great ways to support our show directly. Be our boss at patreon.com slash DTNS. We also have an email address, and that email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're waiting for your email. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern at 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>